there's something happening, there's a vote that's going to be on sequestration. We already had a 7.9% cut this year. They want to do more. And that's a real problem. So if you're interested in calling your senators or representatives federal, not state, about reta uh, retaining and maintaining all the geriatric education programs at the current funding level, that would be so good. Okay. Last but not least, tear that one out, give that one a long run, and then there's the evaluation form. Same thing. Fill it out, tear it out, give it to Barbara. She has a box out there. And then on the break, she has little things that people can fill out. We gave away a lot of door prizes yesterday. They're really nice ones. There's a lot of food, um, things, and uh, fall items, and jewelry, and stuff like that. So, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Carol and Russell, and they're going to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Dr. Royal, my boss. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. My name is Russell Gator, and I'm a licensed clinical social worker. I'm with Beach House Hospice. And with me is Carol Burge. I'm Carol Burge. I'm an elder law attorney here in San Antonio, certified by the Medical Ethics Commission. And I'm also a licensed clinical social worker. Certifiable. That's <laughs> that was yesterday. <laughs> and, and how are you today? Well, I'm really excited. Because we were here yesterday and I learned two things about Alzheimer's, about dementia. Do you want to hear them? I want to hear them. Tell okay, me well, one is you forget things. And two is you forget things. <laughs> Very astute, Carol. That's why she's the attorney and I'm not. <laughs> How does that make you feel? No. <laughs> This morning, uh, Dr. Donald Royal will be uh, talking with us about some of the advancements in this subject, actually. Uh, he's developed two widely used executive cognitive function measures. One is which is the executive interview, uh, the so-called Exit 25. Uh, Dr. Royal is chief of the Division of Aging and Geriatric Psychiatry and a professor in the Departments of Medicine and Pharmacology at the University of Texas Health Science Center at San Antonio. Let's welcome Dr. Royal. Well, thank you very much. So, uh, they, they must have been reading my old CD. I'm not actually in the Department of Pharmacology anymore. I'm in the Departments of Medicine, Psychiatry, and Family Community Medicine at the medical school. But uh, I attribute all my uh, dementia expertise to my uh, time at Texas A&M, uh, where uh, I became uh, an Aggie. And they, they taught me most of what I know about dementia. And then from then on, I've been adding things over the year. And I was uh, going to talk today about, uh, they, they asked me to talk about what's new in geriatric mental health. Uh, Dr. Busey gets to talk about what's new about one disease. They asked me to cover the territory here. And I, I thought I'd try to bring out things that I uh, I bet you haven't heard about Alzheimer's and uh, depression and delirium. And uh, so I'm going to cover each of these here. Uh, what's new in dementia, I'll spend about half the hour on that, and then uh, uh, 15 minutes or so on depression and finish up with a, just a little nugget of something about delirium. Uh, when it comes to uh, dementia, People generally think of Alzheimer's and they think of this guy, uh, Alzheimer, a pathologist in Germany who was kind of at the right place at the right time when they were developing stains for the first time that would allow them to uh, find new lesions in the brain. And so this was very high tech for the time. And he was in one of the labs that had access to these newly developed stains. And uh, that's how he came up with, with this. But actually, uh, he didn't name the disease for himself. His boss named it after him, uh, somewhat later. And his boss was Amy O'Crinkland, who uh, had become famous uh, previously for having uh, named uh, and discovered schizophrenia. And uh, he called it early dementia, dementia precox. That was his name for schizophrenia. Uh, but back then, in the early 20th century, nobody was talking memory loss or cognitive impairment. 
And furthermore, they didn't think of dementia as an old person's problem. Uh, what they were talking about was functional incapacity, mental incapacity, or incapacity, functional incapacity due to mental problems. And so it was easy for them to call schizophrenia a dementia, even though it affected young persons. Uh, they could easily talk about depression as a dementia, and they were not thinking cognitive impairment or uh, memory loss. As a matter of fact, Alzheimer's patients uh, were all in their 40s and mid-50s. Uh, he wasn't talking about a disease of older people, and it stayed like that until the late 60s when people started to notice that a whole lot of old people have this same thing that you might as well call Alzheimer's disease. Uh, but up until the 60s, they thought of Alzheimer's as a rare disorder of younger persons, and not as a disorder of aging. And this is what Alzheimer's saw. Uh, these two lesions here, uh, which uh, my pointer. Yeah, there is a pointer. I don't know if you can see it. I can't see it from here. But anyway, there's two lesions, the plaque and the tangle. Uh, this is the plaque here. And these are tangles. And of these two lesions, we're uh, right now developing uh, treatments against the amyloid that is a protein that makes up the plaque. But it's actually not very strongly related to cognition. It's the tangle that's more strongly related to cognition than amyloid. And if you adjust for tangle counts, amyloid has no correlation with cognition. So it's not obvious to me that effective treatments against amyloid, should they be developed, are going to make a big difference in uh, dementia or cognitive impairment. Uh, and we don't really have anything to address tangles right now. And the truth is, there are other pathologies that Alzheimer didn't describe that are even more strongly related to cognition than the tangle. And the, the strongest one we know of is called synaptic density. But it's so difficult to measure synaptic density that we hardly ever try. And, uh, but in the background, uh, amyloid might correlate 0.2 or 0.3 with cognitive severity, uh, which means it can explain 4 to 5% of the variance uh, tangles would correlate moderately about 0.5, uh, which means they can explain about 25% of the variance in cognition. Uh, but synaptic density is the strongest pathological correlate of cognition that we know of, and it correlates 0.7 or higher with uh, synaptic density, so it's pretty strong. Another thing uh, a lot of people don't appreciate about Alzheimer's is uh, these lesions don't grow in your brain like mushrooms. It's not rot in the brain. It's crawling through the brain in a very interesting way. These are tangles here, progressing step by step by step by step through the brain, following the wiring. So uh, basically the tangles are invading the brain. Right? They're not just growing up all over the place. They're invading it from a particular port of entry that appears to be the first of 12 cranial nerves. And this cranial nerve is the only part of the central nervous system that is out there in the real world, uh, outside your skull. And it's your olfactory nerve. It's the sense of smell. So uh, one of the very first symptoms of Alzheimer's is to lose your sense of smell. Uh, but at that point, who cares? So nobody even pays any attention to the fact that they've lost their smell. But you can, we can use this in the clinic as a way of trying to figure out who really has Alzheimer's. It's almost impossible to become demented by Alzheimer's and not have your sense of smell uh, impaired. Because the tangles can't get into the brain deep enough to cause dementia unless they go through the parts of the brain related to smell. And then after that, the parts related to memory. And after that, uh, parts related to emotional control. And so the story of Alzheimer's represents the progression of tangles, essentially, through neuronal networks. And the sequence of the symptoms uh, betrays this propagation. So this is a data set from France. Uh, every, I know you can't see this from the back, but every row on here is a different region in the brain. And the parts that are shaded blue are the parts that have uh, telepathy or tangles in them. And uh, the parts in columns, each column is a particular autopsy case. So there's 128 cases here. And uh, each uh, one that's colored red at the top is considered demented by clinicians before they die. And so what you can see here is the tangles spread step by step 
but dementia develops about halfway through the progression. Okay, and furthermore, uh, the tangles appear to have a block back in the early parts off to the left. And, oops. And in here, this is where the hippocampus is. So the, the memory loss of Alzheimer's <laughs> precedes dementia. And then dementia doesn't occur until you get out here. Okay. And uh, the tangle counts seem to have a wall back in the hippocampus. So in this slide here, I'm showing you the number of tangles per high-powered field under the microscope as a function of how far down the network the tangles have progressed. And this is data from Hawaii. These are 450 uh, autopsy brains from uh, the Honolulu Asia aging study. And uh, this is the average for the population. Now, these are mostly considered normal persons. Very few of them had an interest. It's a population-based study, not a, a memory clinic sample. Uh, and so it is true that most brains have some tangles in the hippocampus, uh, approximately 90% or more. In this sample, 89% of community-dwelling older persons have tangles in the brain somewhere. So no one is escaping Alzheimer's. But very few of them were demented. And to be demented, the tangles have to reach certain key regions of interest. And in most of these cases, it didn't get that far. Those key regions would be off here on the right. TPFO represent parts of the cortex where uh, most of the cognitive impairments arise from. Uh, but off to the left here is the hippocampus, <laughs> and uh, that's not enough Alzheimer's pathology to result in dementia. And these people back here have huge tangle counts. Look at this, up in the hundreds, hundreds of tangles per uh, microscopic field uh, as the pathologist looks in there. But there's a wall here in this part called cibiculum, the sub. That's the output center for the hippocampus. It's the part that connects to the rest of the brain. So it looks to me like there's a dam at the cibiculum that's keeping tangles pinned up behind it. And behind the dam, tangle counts go up, 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 up. But very few cases have many tangles past the cibiculum, which would be into the business parts of the brain where uh, the cognitive impairments we call dementia must arise. So uh, in most cases, there are tangles in the brain, but they're behind this barrier. And then, in a few people, some other shoe drops. It's not tangle formation because they already have tangles. They have hundreds of tangles in the brain. But unless it gets out of the cibiculum, it's not going to go anywhere important enough to you that you would uh, suffer a functional or a cognitive deficit. And the key uh, region appears to be this step right here. This is the only step that is both necessary for dementia and sufficient. All of this pathology back here on the left is insufficient to cause dementia. You can see there aren't very many dementia cases there. And it turns out at autopsy, every one of them turned out to be vascular dementia on the left. In other words, they had Alzheimer's lesions in the brain, but they also had some strokes somewhere, and it was the strokes that gave them dementia, not the Alzheimer's lesions. So that pathology off here, the whole first half of the disease, is not sufficient to cause anything that you would call dementia. And every, everything that happens after that, on the right, is unnecessary for dementia, because you're already demented. So it really doesn't matter whether it gets into the language centers or into the uh, parietal lobes and causes constructional uh, uh, apraxia or uh, you know, trouble dressing or using force. These are symptoms that you see in nursing home residents, and they're not part of the dementia because the dementia already happened. You see, they are icing on the cake that betray the way the Alzheimer's lesions are progressing through the brain. And the key region is just one step here, which has four uh, elements. These are four different places in the brain here in this study. Pathology in that one step correctly classifies 89% of these cases as demented or not. So in terms of deciding if a person is demented, it turns out there's just one step in the progression that explains that. And everything else is either unnecessary for dementia or insufficient for dementia. It's just icing on the cake. And those four places are in red here. And they're called the default mode network. 
Now, I did this analysis in 1999, and uh, no one had named the default mode network yet. So I couldn't say that that's what this is. All I could say was, tangles, I mean, dementia is not the burden, the weight of all your uh, lesions. People were thinking of it that way, that, that Alzheimer's pathology piles up until there's enough. And then there's a threshold, and if you go over that threshold, you'll become demented. But that's not what this analysis says. What this analysis says is dementia is a place. And unless tangles are in that place, you are not demented. And once they get to that place, you're demented, and it doesn't matter what happens after that. That's what my analysis said. And furthermore, so I rushed off to Google, and I said, show me every paper ever written that has these four places in it. And there was only one. And it was a study where uh, uh, they put a lesion here in the frontal lobe and the other places died back. So they were connected to the frontal lobe by a single synapse. And remember, the tangles are pro progressing through the brain following the synapses, following the wiring. So once it got into one, it could get into all of them you know, and uh, convert you to dementia. Later on, though, uh, someone presented the brain rounds and they were from the imaging community and they're doing studies in uh, awake subjects with fMRI, and they showed their graph of this default mode network, and I said, hey, that's my network. That's exactly my network. And what uh, led them to call it the default mode network is it's uh, what's active in the brain when you're not doing anything. In other words, the control groups in all these studies all over the world would be told to just lie here and we'll be back in a little while. And in those people, the default mode network was active. But in the active uh, experimental group, they would be given a cognitive test. And it really didn't matter what test they were given. As soon as the psychologist gave them the test and they started to work on it, the default mode network would turn off and some other part of the brain would turn on. And depending on the task, that would determine what part of the brain turned on. The memory part, or the language part, or the mathematics part. It just depends on what you're being asked to do. But as soon as you're through doing that, hey, you're back to the default mode network. But you don't lie in the scanner and do nothing, right? You plan your day. You're sitting in there going, what am I going to do with this $500 honorary? Right? Where am I going to go after they let me out of here? Right? How long do you think people can stand being in here? Right? That's your active mental life. And slowly, we're starting to realize that this isn't the default. They call it the default network because it just didn't do anything. But no part of the brain does nothing. Now they're realizing that this is where your sense of self is. This part of the brain turns off when I give you a cognitive test. It turns on when I ask you, how are you doing? Are you feeling pain? Is your quality of life good? What did you have for breakfast this morning? In other words, autobiographical tasks. Anything related to your sense of self activates this key network. And when tangles get into it, you become demented. And uh, this has some really interesting implications. Uh, People have independently, previously, done studies like this. These are the parts of the brain that are hypometabolic when you become uh, demented. You can see now that it's the default mode network. The, the two easiest ones to see here are this big one here, the posterior cingulate, and uh, this one here, the angular gyrus. So you can see there it is. See that? Here's the posterior cingulate. Those are the ones to look for, uh, trying to see these images. But, but so. These people had already found my network, the default mode network, is hypometabolic in demented Alzheimer's cases, but it was too early. This was in 1996. The default mode network didn't have a name, so they just said, parts of the brain go dark as you become demented. Right? But here's a study of strokes. This is the places in the brain where a single stroke causes dementia. It's the default mode network again. So this association with dementia really has nothing to do with tangles or Alzheimer's disease. It has to do with dementia and what makes a person demented. And it doesn't matter which pathology is getting in there, strokes or tangles. If they affect the default mode network, you become demented because there's no sense of the self engaging the environment anymore. You're not planning your day anymore. You're not thinking of the consequences of your actions. 
you're not wondering what's the best way to get from point A to point B. Because that's what the default mode network is involved with. Uh, and this has some really interesting implications. Uh, uh, this guy, Christopher Wren, is a famous architect who used to moonlight for a neurologist named Willis uh, in the 1600s. <coughs> And he used to draw pictures of the brain, these dissections for the, uh, the neurologist who was writing a book on uh, uh, the brain and its anatomy. And as an architect, though, he started to look at this and said, you know, a brain is built like a castle. And I just told you the tangles are invading. They're coming uh, into the castle. And there's only two ways to go into a castle. You can go in through the walls. In which case, you land randomly somewhere in the castle. So if you go into the brain through the walls, then uh, depending on where you land, there's going to be some symptoms, but there's no order to them, there's no story, there's no sequence, there's no beginning, there's no middle, there's no end. And some dementias work like that. One example is vascular disease. In vascular disease, there's no stages of vascular disease. There's no beginning of vascular, middle, of vascular, there's no end of vascular. You just throw the dice and see if today you have a stroke, right? And if the stroke lands here, you lose your sense of language. If it lands there, you can't feel the right side of your face. If it's over here, you can't use your left hand, right? That's not a story. That's just throwing the dice. But Alzheimer's and other neurodegenerative disorders aren't like that. Instead, they go in through the gates. And when you go in through the gate, the castle reveals itself to you as a series of passages. You can't get there from here. So you have to go through the castle in a certain sequence. And the sequence is determined by the portal of entry. Right? And that means that diseases that go through the wiring like this are going to have a story that's stereotyped across individuals. It'll have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And the story is determined solely by the portal of entry, right? So in Alzheimer's, you lose your sense of smell, but smell is wired into the hippocampus. That's why uh, smells bring back memories. So the tangles go to the hippocampus and you start to become forgetful. But not just any kind of memory is processed there. A lot of them are emotional. That's why smells bring out emotional memories. So then, you know, next thing you know, it's in a place called the amygdala which makes them ornery. And they go, God damn it, I told you I don't have memory loss. I don't want to take these things. Right? So that's part of the story. And then it goes back, 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 step by step, until, bang, dementia happens when it gets to the default mode network. And then after that, you use uh, some language, naming things, uh, dressing abilities, things like that. But by then, it's too late. You're already demented, and you're in the nursing home. So, the story of Alzheimer's can be uh, more or less interpreted as the sequence of regions of interest that succumb to tangles as they march through the brain, following the wiring from a portal of entry that would be the first cranial nerve. But, you know, there are 12 nerves. There are 12 gates to the castle. And if Alzheimer's can go up the first one, why can't it go up some other ones? But if it did go up some other ones, the story would be different. Because it's a different portal of entry. And you wouldn't recognize it as Alzheimer's because it's not following the right story. But in pathology, it would be Alzheimer's, paradoxically. And so there are variants of Alzheimer's. And some of those look like they go in the wrong gate. Uh, one famous one of these is called posterior cortical degeneration or the Bailey syndrome. At autopsy, they have tangles and amyloid, but they're in the wrong places. And the first symptom of that one is to go blind, not to lose memory. Right? And then dementia follows blindness. And it's not, you know, you can't see anymore, it's you can't understand what you're seeing. So it's a central uh, visual processing deficit. And there's the second cranial nerve. Guess where it goes? It goes to the occipital lobes first. That's the last place tangles usually go when they start in from the nose. You see? So Alzheimer's patients also develop what's called visual agnosia, not recognizing symptoms, I mean, uh, things they look at. They, they don't even recognize their own face in the mirror, or uh, you may tell them to pick up the fork and they look around at the table and they just don't see it. It's right there in front of them. But they can't uh, recognize it, right? 
But that's an early symptom of the Bailey syndrome, which is great. But you got 10 more nerves to go. For all I know, maybe there's a different syndrome for every one. Maybe some of them don't go to the default mode network, in which case I wouldn't, they, they wouldn't uh, manifest dementia. For all I know, they're, they're holed up in ENT clinics where people have swallowing disorders. Some of these nerves, you know, who knows where they go. They're, they're into deeper, more primitive parts of the brain. Uh, one potential one would be this one, the eighth cranial nerve, which supplies your ear. Because just like the Balin syndrome is central, auto, I mean, visual processing deficits, there are many people who have central auditory processing deficits, right? That hearing aids don't help them because it's not in the ear, it's in the brain. So they can't hear language so well because they can't recognize it. In the same way, or an analogous way to the, the visual deficits of the Balin syndrome. And the hearing aids don't help because it's not about noise or sound. It's about recognition. Uh, and that uh, kind of, uh, of hearing loss is now being associated with dementia. It's a dementia risk. You see? So that could be one. And then the most intriguing of all right now is this one, cranial nerve number 10, which is the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve supplies the organs in your body. And it looks like Lewy body dementia, which is an all, uh, a different neurodegenerative syndrome that sort of resembles Alzheimer's, is crawling up that one. So the Lewy bodies, it's a completely different dementia described by a pathologist named Louis. Uh, there are lesions just like tangles, uh, and they're made out of proteins, but they're not the same as the proteins that make up the tangle, and the lesion isn't the same under the microscope. But he described this, and it's associated with Parkinsonism, right? As a matter of fact, in Parkinson's disease, which usually doesn't cause dementia, uh, there are Louis bodies in that too. But both Lewy body dementia, where you have a little Parkinsonism and a lot of dementia, and Parkinson's disease, where you have a lot of Parkinsonism and little dementia, both of them have Lewy bodies, and both of them seem to start extracranially in the organs of your body and their uh, neuronal innervation, and work their way backwards into the brain following the wiring. So uh, one of the earliest signs of Lewy body dementia is Lewy bodies in the heart's innervation, which leads to cardiac arrhythmias, particularly one called atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation is a risk factor for Lewy body dementia and Parkinson's. Both. And the genes that are associated with AFib are genes that predict Parkinson's disease, too. So there's a link there. And the Japanese are showing that you can show the Lewy bodies not just in the heart, but in all of the uh, organs that are innervated by the brain. So uh, there are Lewy bodies in the GE junction in the esophagus. And when they're in there, patients have acid reflux disease. And there are Lewy bodies in the coma. And when uh, they're there, uh, patients complain of constipation. And there are Lewy bodies in the bladder. And when they're there, people have incomplete emptying syndromes and recurrent UTIs. So Lewy body patients begin their careers as medical patients, and nobody sees it coming. They don't see that these things are linked, right? So in the electronic medical record, I just point that out to the residents. Do you know that this person with monocognitive impairment has AFib, GERD, constipation, and acid reflux disease? Guess what they're going to do, right? And then uh, they come up into the brain, the wiring, and following the wiring, uh, that is going to be the story of Lewy body disease. So Lewy body patients have a higher risk of falls than Alzheimer's because the innervation to the heart is destroyed. And uh, they have a higher rate of mortality because they have cardiac arrhythmias. And they have comorbid stroke because they develop arrhythmias that lead to embolic lesions that lead to strokes. So many of them are misclassified as vascular dementias. Or maybe they started out their career as vascular dementia. And, you know, hell, they got a bit, right? And so it makes perfect sense. But then they develop the symptoms of Lewy body disease, and you misattribute them to new strokes and don't realize that they're really changing their stripes out from under you. It's not vascular dementia anymore. Now it's Lewy body. He has Parkinson's. He has falls. He has visual hallucinations. He has spells. All of that in a guy who's had one stroke from his AFib or has a pacemaker 
or is on Coumadin, you know, blood thinner. So, uh, Lewy body is potentially at work in multiple organs. And so, the Lewy body syndrome is going to start out as a bunch of medical problems. And you can see that uh, Alzheimer's patients come to clinic and their chart is only this high. And they're on three medicines and one of them is Aricet. As a matter of fact, the literature talks about how Alzheimer's patients are healthier than usual. Right? They tend to be extra healthy. Uh, but Lewy body patients come and their medical chart is this thick and they're on 22 medicines. And they get on this roller coaster of cognitive confusion partly because they're on 22 medicines. But they have to be on 22 medicines because they have autonomic disruption of 22 organs. And each one has bought a different uh, treatment over the years. So that's a big uh, difference. <coughs> Now I'm going to show you some of the stuff uh, <coughs> I'm doing here. Um, uh, because of this tension, what this does is it disentangles the Alzheimer's story from all the other dementia stories. So, you know, the, the stages of dementia that everybody talks about are really Alzheimer's specific, and they don't make sense even for Lewy body. Right? Because Lewy body came in through a different gate, and it's following a different sequence of uh, symptoms. And that story isn't the same as the Alzheimer's story. Uh, so I, I went back to the beginning, you know, what is dementia? How can we uh, get a handle on dementia itself? And uh, so dementia is cognitive impairment in a clear sensorium sufficient to cause disability. And that's the rub, because actually very few cognitive tests predict functional status. And those that do don't predict a particularly strong one. It's just sort of average. And so I started building models like this, and uh, uh, look close, there's going to be a test on this. <laughs> uh, but basically, nobody is showing specifically which cognitive functions are related to functional status. Right? And that's the problem. So, uh, we tackled this through what are called uh, structural equation models, which sound fancy, but they're not like, they're not rocket science, they're, they're pretty simple. But you can graph them like this. And so, a uh, this rectangle here is a measure that we actually observe, in this case, in patients from the Texas Alzheimer's Research Consortium that I'll tell you more about in a minute. And so this is a traditional cognitive battery that we use for Alzheimer's cases. And there's a memory test and a visual test and verbal fluency and naming, attention. And uh, here are caregiver rated functional status items. These happen to be what are called instrumental activities of daily living. They're higher level things like driving, shopping, cooking. And then these are basic activities of daily living, which are things like uh, uh, you know, getting dressed or being able to use uh, utensils when you eat. And uh, out of these things, we distill them together and we get what are called latent variables. These are round and they're things you can't measure directly or you're not measuring directly. It's what uh, so G here is what these things all share. So uh, a psychologist named Spearman, as early as 1904, found that every cognitive measure shares some variance with every other one. So no matter what the test purports to measure, one of them says it's a memory test and the other one says it's an executive test, but they both share one big thing in common, and he called it G for general intelligence. And the only reason this one can claim to be a memory test is with the tiny fraction of its power that is not related to G, because G is not really memory. It's not really executive function. It's not really language. It's everything, right? And uh, that's been shown over and over that there's this big thing, G. But G doesn't correlate with functional status very well. It only correlates about 0.4, which means that 16% of the variance in every cognitive battery is related to functional status. Would you go to court and swear before a judge that this person can or cannot drive knowing that your battery can only explain 16% of the variance in functional status? And you can't do better than that. I've reviewed the literature. It doesn't matter what tests are in there. G doesn't matter. All tests measure G to some extent. So it doesn't matter whether you only had the mini metal or whether you had every card carrying uh, difficult test there is available. It wouldn't matter. It's always uh, coming down to G. So uh, we created one called F for functional status. That's what all these functional status measures share. And then I made a new one called D for dementia. 
And it's what cognition shares with functional status. And that's the trick of structural equations, is I can do stuff with that. So now I have a dementia score. This dementia score correlates 0.9 with dementia severity, uh, measured by uh, uh, what's called the clinical dementia rating scale. And independently of D, the rest of G has almost no correlation with dementia severity, even though G explains 60% of the variance in this battery. And what that tells you is that most cognitive tests don't measure dementia. And that's why, after 20 years of giving y'all talks, everybody's still asking me, what's the best cognitive measure to measure dementia? <laughs> right? And nobody can find it, because it doesn't exist. Because fundamentally, dementia is not cognitive impairment. And the reason for that is probably because when you ask the person any memory question, the default mode network turns off, and you're not measuring it anymore. You're measuring the parts of the brain whose pathology is irrelevant to your functional status. You see? So there is a fundamental obstacle to using cognitive measures to understand dementia. Sure, they have memory loss, they have cognitive impairment, but that's not why they're demented. They're demented because something is wrong with this default mode network, and it's like a slippery eel. You can't measure it with cognitive tests. Because as soon as you ask the guy a question, it turns off. So you're not uh, addressing it. You see? It'd be easier to address it through maybe self-report. Right? Do you trust the pain assessments of demented persons in the nursing home? Do you trust their assessments of their quality of life? Right? Do you go out and find feedback from demented persons in your healthcare system to see if the clinics can be improved? Is that what you're doing? <laughs> because they don't have a sense of self. Do you know that the requirement for pain medicine reduces as uh, persons with arthritis become demented? Because they don't experience, there's pain in the room, but it's not mine. There is no need. Because the default mode network is degraded by the disease. Okay? But D is dementia. And having to find it, look how good it is at predicting who has Alzheimer's. It's ROC is 0.99 for the distinction between dementia and no dementia. Uh, G, which is 60% of the variance in the cognitive battery, is little better than chance. And functional status, uh, the fraction of functional status not related to cognition, has no impact at all. Right? Because it's physical problems. Right? You're blind, but that's why you can't do your shopping. Right? It has nothing to do with your uh, cognition. Okay, and uh, once we have this, we have dementia in a bottle where we can interrogate it. I can give every person in the cohort, really every person in this room, a dementia score. And it will be a continuous variable from no dementia at all to the worst case. And I can rank order each individual for how demented they are. And quit worrying about categories like are they MCI or dementia. Because that wastes information. We could say, you're 22 and a third percent dependent, and you're 22 and three quarters dependent, right? And having that, done that, we can uh, use much more advanced statistical uh, methods called parametric statistics to do this. So uh, I've image D for you, and here are the parts of the brain whose atrophy is related to dementia. Guess where that is? It's the default mode network again. So that comes completely around the circle. And now, we're finding, uh, other groups are finding, just recently, that amyloid is being deposited specifically in the neurons of the default mode network. I told you it's not, it's not uh, mushrooms, it's just growing all over the place. Amyloid is being deposited in the default mode network. And I already showed you that if tangles ever get there, you'll become demented. So, do you think amyloid being in your default mode network is bad? No. Non-demented persons have amyloid in their default mode networks. It's there before, years before, dementia can be diagnosed. Years before dementia is diagnosed, tangles are somewhere else. They're not in your default mode network. So the amyloid is in the default mode network in advance of tangles, waiting for them. Right? 
that's why amyloid doesn't correlate with cognition. Right? Tangles correlate with cognition. So here is the default mode network in blue. So you got this nice big posterior cingulate. Here is where amyloid is deposited in non-demented persons. You see, it's the default mode network. Here is where D lives in the brain. This is the atrophy. That atrophy is related not to amyloid, but to tangles. So basically, if the tangles get into your default mode network, you become demented. But the amyloid's already there. And in some of our studies, we're finding that the amount of amyloid is inversely related to the amount of tangles. The more amyloid you have, the less tangles get in there. And uh, so I think it's a landmine. It's a defense, a passive defense. You lay out your landmines when you know the enemy is coming, but before they get there. And as long as there's no enemy around, the landmines don't do anything. But they protect your most important property. And then when the enemy shows up, the landmines go off and bad things happen. Neurons die, inflammation starts, all sorts of terrible things related to amyloid. But some neurons need to be killed. And those would be ones that are invading by, with uh, maybe viruses or prions, who knows. But there, there are very few things that can crawl through your brains following the wiring. And one of them is viruses, and another one uh, are uh, abnormal proteins called prions. And regardless of which one of those is responsible for this sort of systematic, progressive, stepwise propagation of these lesions. Uh, the amyloid is there in advance, it doesn't do that, it waits for them. And then, when they get there, stuff happens and you become demented. But every neuron you kill protects all the ones downstream from it. Right? So what you're doing is sacrificing some of the network to keep the network intact. Right? And uh, networks can be degraded and still function. Uh, for quite a while. So you, you know that because uh, the internet keeps going on even though half the servers go down every day. Right? But, but the internet stays there. So this little movie here represents the spread of atrophy through the brain in uh, non demented persons as they become demented. So this movie is serial MRI scans over about three years as mild cognitive impairment cases turn into dementia cases. Uh, the mini metal drops five points on average over these three years. And in those three years, you can see the, the atrophy creep down the brain and creep up. But that's the part of the brain that has the least amyloid. The part with the least amyloid is experiencing the most rapid atrophy. The part with the most amyloid is the default mode network. And that's the last place to go dark. You see that? So, nature doesn't make bad proteins. Proteins don't misfold, right? Na nature makes proteins do exactly what they do, and amyloid can cause inflammation and kill neurons. But it's designed for that. And so you have to ask yourself, it begs the question, why would it even be there? Why would it do all of that? Uh, it's not going to be an aberration. It's an adaptation. And that begs the question, an adaptation to what? Right? Well, humans uh, are victims of uh, predators that live in our brains. And those predators are viruses. And we know they're there because we can find their DNA. Right? So they're there in the central nervous systems of persons who have no symptoms. Uh, and the best example of this would be herpes zoster, uh, which causes shingles. Right? But it starts out its career as chickenpox, and you've all had chickenpox. And so right now, there is herpes softer DNA in your spinal cords. And you don't have any symptoms. It takes another shoe to drop. Some other shoe, usually uh, an immunocompromising uh, challenge. You get old, you get on steroids, you have some injury, and out they come. Because they're trying to get out of you and go away. They're not trying to take advantage of your disability and invade the sinking ship. They're leaving the Titanic. <laughs> it's time to go find somebody else. Right? So they're on their way out. And I think that's a model to think about how Alzheimer's might work. We're all in the 89% of persons in Hawaii have tangles in their brain. But it's behind the dam. You see? 
some other shoe has to drop to get over that hump and get into the rest of the brain and wake up the monster. And uh, then <coughs> symptoms would come out and the amyloid would do its job, it would kill neurons. And the alternative, though, is encephalitis. So anybody can look at uh, someone with encephalitis and make that diagnosis. It's actually hard to diagnose Alzheimer's. A lot of primary care doctors have trouble doing it. That's how good a deal it is. You see? And that's the way to look at it. Kind of like sickle cell anemia. Sickle cell anemia is not a disease. It's uncomfortable. It's uh, you know, a threat to your lifestyle. It's painful. But it's an adaptation to the real existence of a deadly predator called malaria. You see? So humankind benefits from sickle cell anemia. But individuals are sacrificed. And that's the way nature works. It doesn't really care about you. It cares about all of us. Right? And so we can look at these things as adaptations from a more uh, valid evolutionary standpoint. So here is the state of Alzheimer's drug research. These are in the middle of the drugs that are approved. So we have four that are approved now. And then around that are drugs that have been recently in phase three clinical trials uh, where they're giving them to actual Alzheimer's patients, see what happens. And then behind that are a whole bunch that are in phase two. Uh, they're trying to see if they're safe uh, in humans. And then behind that are these phase one drugs that they're trying to see if they work in animals. And then there are a bunch of pine in the sky sort of hypotheses orbiting around the outer limits here. Everything on the left, though, is targeting amyloid, right? Because that's the big deal. That's what everybody's trying to do. Here are the ones that have failed. All of them. So uh, they, we just had another one uh, this summer. So, uh, uh, by my last count, somewhere approaching 22 different clinical trials against amyloid have been mounted and they've all failed. Uh, but I think that's just because the light is better there. But uh, they're not looking in the right place. Right? Amyloid is not going to be the problem. Something else is the problem and we have to start thinking about what it could be. Uh, I want to draw your attention to this drug, rapamycin. Uh, because a lot of the primary work on it is being done here in San Antonio out of the Barshop Institute. And this drug, in animal models of Alzheimer's, eliminates amyloid, eliminates flax, and improves memory. Because in rats, uh, uh, amyloid causes uh, you know, neuronal dysfunction and amyloid is deposited. But uh, rats don't normally make tangles or amyloid <coughs> in their brains. These models have to be engineered by taking the human genes and sticking them in there. And the rats also don't have a whole bunch, a whole class of predatory viruses that they have to contend with. So they didn't evolve defenses for that problem. They're our problem. They're human diseases, uh, these viruses. And that may be why old animals in zoos don't get Alzheimer's. Did you know that? Old giraffes, lions, tigers, gorillas, they don't get Alzheimer's when they get old. They don't get diabetes. They don't get heart disease. They get cancers, right? So there are some things they get, but they're not necessarily the things we get or things we call aging, right? And it begs the question of what then is aging, right? If it's not your diabetes, not your Alzheimer's, not your heart disease, what is it? And what's making these uh, diseases appear in the late old age, uh, in humans specifically, right? Uh, so uh, I think these could all end up being related. And uh, to study that, because the, you know, the baby boomers are coming no matter what, uh, the state of Texas is uh, investing in Alzheimer's research through what's called the Texas Alzheimer's Research Consortium. Uh, this is a relatively new thing, and we're a site here in San Antonio. We've recruited 350 subjects into more or less 2,000 over the whole state. We're following them annually over time. Some are demented, some have mild cognitive impairment, some are normal, and most of them are Hispanic. So we're providing a lot of the Hispanics to this uh, cohort here, and uh, that's where uh, a lot of my recent models have been built. Uh, and one of the interesting things I'll just leave dementia with is that uh, in part we get uh, a blood test that uh, screens them for maybe 150 different proteins circulating around in the body. Uh, 
And uh, so TARC has been trying, like other uh, research groups, to develop a blood test for Alzheimer's. But so far, everybody is trying to associate the tests with a clinical diagnosis, which is a category, which means they're limited because they have to use what are called non-parametric statistics that are weaker statistical methods. But D is a continuous variable. And so we can be much more powerful and with a smaller sample uh, make an association. And so I found here uh, 11 proteins that are related to the D score of participants in TARC. And uh, these could potentially become a blood test for your D score, right? It would tell you who has a high D score, who has a low D score, and that translates into dementia and atrophy and fall down network. Uh, but when we look at these, uh, they seem to have two populations. You see that? Here is one of these proteins. It's called thrombocoitin. It's a, uh, it's a chemical that stimulates, uh, attracts uh, platelets. And so you can see there's two populations. And I looked at that and I said, hmm, Hispanics, Anglo. Those are the two kinds of patients we have in TARC. And sure enough, there's a huge ethnicity effect on each of those 11 proteins. And what it turns out is this is a blood test for, it turns out it's best for mild cognitive impairment, but it only works in Anglos. It doesn't work at all in Hispanics. And what that would mean is that Hispanics are getting dementia through other biological means than the 11 proteins on this list. Uh, but in Anglos, it works pretty well. And all of these proteins, can be related back to uh, viral infections. There are proteins that are uh, released in response to viral infections. And as a matter of fact, they're change, they change when a normal person becomes mild cognitive impairment, and as they go on to dementia, these proteins all go back to normal. So I think what uh, we're documenting is waking up the monster. You know, your, your virus has been asleep for 22 years. But when it wakes up, you go from normal to MCI, and then stuff happens, right? And that stuff is inflammation and uh, neural disruption and uh, all sorts of inflammatory changes. But they're prosecuting the war. But I think uh, what these proteins might document is the initial invasion or the re-invasion as the, as the viruses wake up. And uh, why would Mexican-Americans be different than Anglo? in the first place. Why would they be so radically different on these uh, proteins? And uh, one thing I want you to remember is that uh, Mexican history is very special and unique from one biological point of view, which is that living Mexican Americans are descended from the very few survivors of huge epidemics in the 1500s. So when the Spanish came, the Indians were not experienced with many diseases we take for granted as childhood diseases, like measles, right, or mumps. Uh, and it killed millions of people. And very few, relatively few as a percentage, survived, even though that was a pretty big number. And we're not really sure how many, that, what fraction that is, because we don't really know the denominator. We don't know how many uh, Indians there were when Columbus showed up. But Recent archaeological evidence suggests that it was many more than we've thought so far. So even more. So that would make that fraction even smaller, which means the impact would be even bigger uh, in the survivors. So it may very well be that Mexican Americans, uniquely because of this genetic background, uh, respond to inflammation and diseases, uh, infectious diseases, in a different way. Because they've been highly selected to have survived uh, you know, their ancestors to have survived these epidemics. Anyway, and then one other thing is that the default mode network is activated by self-report. And so um, uh, you want to think about this. It's a specific problem in Alzheimer's that they lose their sense of self-awareness. And uh, you can't really trust them for self-report. And that gets you to depression. Uh, because depressed persons also have problems with self-report uh, and it's turning out that depression is associated with changes in the default mode network. So in the case of depression, the default mode network is overactive. In Alzheimer's, it's underactive.
So it's as though yourself won't shut up while you do your memory test, right? You're not going to do that, right? You never do anything, right? This is not going to work out. He shouldn't be asking you these questions, right? So depressed persons become ruminative about their self-awareness. They're worried about their pain. This is never going to get better. Uh, you know, and that's a character of, de of depression that may be related to hyperactivity in the default mode network in contrast to hypoactivity in Alzheimer's. So uh, antidepressants alter the default mode network's brain function. That's it. <coughs> and here are parts of the brain that are, whose activity is decreased by antidepressant treatment, and these are increased, and the ones in yellow here are the default mode network. So not only does depression affect the default mode network's function, antidepressant treatment modulates the default mode network's function. And so we've been building these models again. My models are, are modular. If I were going to build a model of D, I would have a cognitive battery. It creates G. And then I split G into the fraction not related to functional status and the fraction D that is related to functional status. See how that works? And D correlates really well with dementia severity on the CDR. Okay? But this is modular. All i got to do is change that, and I have the cognitive correlates of mood instead of functional status. And now we have a new latent variable called DEPCOG. Right? It's the cognitive changes specifically related to depression. See, so that's a trick, too. My client is full of people who claim that they are disabled by memory loss, but when we test them, they're normal. Right? And those are depressed persons. So we try to screen them out. We tell the primary care doctor, listen, don't send them to memory clinic until you've checked them for depression and they're not depressed. Because those are not Alzheimer's cases. They complain of memory loss, though. But their performance is normal. But depression is trouble with the default mode network. Whenever the psychologist gives you a test, we're not talking about the default mode network anymore. So maybe that part still works. But they can still be abnormal in the default mode network, and the cognitive test won't detect it. And the cognitive, I mean, the default mode network is disabling when it doesn't work right. It, it affects functional status. So uh, you could easily miss it, right? So here's the uh, debt cog variable. <coughs> it correlates really strongly with depression severity. I mean, with dementia severity. That's weird. As a matter of fact, here's the correlation between D and the cognitive correlates of mood. The cognitive correlates of mood in TARC are correlated very strongly with the cognitive correlates of functional status. They're almost the same thing. They're both mappable to the default mode network. Here is my original model of D, the fancy one. Here's a reduced model, just you know, because I realized that uh, Spearman uh, said we could use any cognitive test, so why use them all? Let's just use a couple. Right? Water it down so it would be quicker and easier to do. And that D, this little D, uh, maps to exactly the same regions of interest. And now, this isn't even the cognitive correlates of functional status. This is the cognitive correlates of mood. You see how it's the same network again? And here's the overlap in pink. So basically, the cognitive correlates of functional status are the cognitive correlates of mood. And that tells you that depression is a dementing illness. I mean, it's not dementing if you think of, uh, it's got to be plaques and tangles for dementia. But that's the wrong way to think about it. The way to think about it is any pathology of the default mode network can disable you. So you have an acquired cognitive impairment that is disabling. Right? This is why depressed persons can't work. They can't go to school. It's a dementia. They weren't demented a week ago, and they're demented. It's an acquired disorder of cognition and a clear sensory insufficient to cause disability. Right? But the take-home message is that you can fix depression, and that means we have drugs already that can modify the default mode network. We just weren't thinking about it that way. We weren't thinking of them as cognitive agents. We were thinking about them as making your quality of life better. Your mood, right? But that's not the way to look at it. This is saying that the cognitive correlates of mood are the cognitive correlates of functional status. And that is fundamentally what dementia is. So you could make the case, as again, Kraepelin was saying, years and years and years ago, 
that schizophrenia is a kind of dementia. Mood disorder is a kind of dementia. But he wasn't talking memory loss. He was talking functional incapacity, right? And so in that sense, uh, everything's gone all the way around and we're back to uh, dementia. So here are, uh, this is where uh, D, this is where dementia lives in the brain and here are the places that uh, have improved metabolism uh, with successful antidepressant treatment. And it's the same network again. So uh, the last thing I want to end up with is just a, a little uh, sideways glance at delirium here. Here's a study of post-cabbage uh, delirium and its effects on cognition. So uh, uh, about half of uh, patients who undergo bypass grafting, you know, a cabbage operation, develop delirium, it's usually on the second hospital day. Delirium in non-demented persons is a risk factor for future dementia. And a lot of clinicians think that, uh, you know, there's sort of a stepwise decline. You get delirious, but you don't really go all the way back to where you were before the delirium. So uh, this is still being investigated. And uh, here's what they found. The patients, this is many mental scores here on the left, uh, so, the delirious persons suffered a drop in their mini mental. Before the operation, they both had normal mini mentals, but they weren't really the sharpest of all attacks. They, they had an average mini mental of around 26 out of 30, so that, that means they're not quite right. Uh, but, you know, they're heart disease patients who need uh, a serious operation. And some of them don't develop delirium, and they have a little bit of a dip, but they go back to their baseline. And the other group, has a more serious drop as they become delirious. This is the second hospital day. But it seems largely to have resolved by the fifth, and at some point they get discharged, and they were followed up at a month, six months, and a year. Right? So now, what's interesting about this draft me is why didn't they go all the way back when the delirium resolved? Right? And if it did resolve, what explains their continued improvement over a year? Because the delirious subgroup had the worst risk factors. They were less educated, they were older, they had more morbidity, they were on more medicines, uh, they had more medical problems, they were more frail. So uh, these cases are improving their cognition over a year with no intervention from us, right? And their brains are the weakest brains of these two groups. So what's explaining that? Because uh, if you if you want to say that it's delirium, then you got to accept that delirium extends for a year after the operation into the post-acute setting, where you're taking care of them. They're still delirious. So do you believe that? Are they delirious up to a year later, and that's just slowly going away, and that's why they get better? Because if you tell me that the delirium was gone two weeks or a week or ten days after the operation, then they went into the post-acute care without delirium, and you've got to find some of their explanation for why their cognition continued to improve. The effect size on this is bigger than Aricept. Bigger than its effect on the mini mental in Alzheimer's cases. So this is not nothing. I mean, it's just a couple of mini mental points, but uh, it's more than Aricept can accomplish on average. So what is it? You know, yeah. Is it that they're rebuilding synapses they lost? Is it that uh, you know, brain, brain function is somehow improving? Because they're the most frail and uh, uh, you know, messed up brains. So uh, they're older, less educated, more likely to have had stroke, TIA, higher comorbidity, and yet, despite all of that, they're getting better uh, week by week by week. So, uh, it would be really interesting to investigate this with modern biomarkers and try to figure out what it is that's changing in the post-acute period. Because if we could bottle it, it might work for dementia. <laughs> right? And the alternative is that delirium extends a hell of a lot longer into post-operative care than we imagine. And we should be doing something about that. Right? Uh, so I don't know the answer to this. It's just a really interesting thing to think about, that even uh, damaged brains with delirium can improve over a year following their insult. Uh, and something must be going on. Okay, so 
the key uh, points here would be that dementia can be localized to a part of the brain, a network, in fact, called the default mode network. And the implications of that go off in all sorts of directions. But, but one of them is that it's a challenge to conceiving of dementia as cognitive impairment. And it explains why, first of all, no criteria for dementia relies solely, exclusively on psychometric testing. You cannot accurately diagnose dementia knowing only the test scores. Right? Somebody's got to look at you and do voodoo and go, ooh, <laughs> dementia, yes. And clearly, there are demented persons who score pretty well on cognitive measures, and there are, and we try to find some explanation for that, and there are other people who perform terribly on cognitive measures, but just look at them. That's not dementia. And so we try to make excuses for this. Right? So that noise has always been there. Uh, otherwise, you could just diagnose dementia purely from a psychometric assessment, and nobody can do that. So, uh, I think the explanation is that dementia is specifically related to a network that cannot be interrogated by cognitive tests. You see? And we have to find new measures that do associate with a default mode network, or we have to build latent models, which are a little baroque, but they work. And through a latent variable approach, we're making a lot of new traction that uh, we were kind of blocked on before. And then I think it's an, an important take on this is that depression is potentially dementic. Because many mild cognitive impairment uh, patients develop depression, and I think they convert to what is called Alzheimer's through a mood disorder. Because it's attacking the same network. So the symptoms resemble the dementia of tangles, but maybe no new tangles were formed. Maybe in those cases, the tangles are behind the wall still. The monster is not woken up. And maybe you could convert them back to non-dementia by treating them for depression with this. Because we can fix depression. We can't fix anymore, we can't fix tangles. But I can fix depression and it dements people. You see? So it's not just a quality of life thing, it's not going to make them happier. That's not the point. The point is, they have been disabled by this cognitive state. And we have effective treatment for that. So I think we should use it. We, uh, I'm now interested in giving all of my dementia cases antidepressants to see if their dementia get better. And it's most likely to work in the early cases where there's less tangled pathology and maybe the wave hasn't reached the default mode network yet. Uh, and then finally, delirium recovery suggests other opportunities for intervention in dementia because the brain is doing something in this year of recovery following delirium. And I'm, I'm not quite yet willing to accept that delirium lasts a whole year, right? But maybe that's true too. Uh, it's going to be a hard, hard to prove. But if it isn't delirium, then these brains are rebuilding themselves somehow. They're recovering from this insult, and we should be uh, able to figure that out, particularly since some populations, like cabbage patients, are demonstrably at risk. If we have those operations in our hospitals every day, so there's an ample supply of people available for study. And we should be looking at it that way. What happens to cabbage patients over the year following their uh, procedure that uh, is the mechanism by which their cognition improves in time. And uh, that might give us more clues to what to do about uh, dementia. Thank you. Uh, would you do so please? And uh, 
thank you again, and uh, we'll continue. Thank you. de caminar, porque no tiene, porque le falta, marihuana que fumar, la cucaracha, la cucaracha.